Hello, everybody, and welcome to another um, Cloud Tool Time. This is our third edition of the Cloud Tool Time series, and today our topic is Eclipse Chain Internals, presented by Mario Lorietto. Mario is the Senior Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat and the Eclipse Chain Project Lead. He's also an architect for Red Hat Code Ready, uh, Code Ready Workspaces, the Red Hat distribution of Eclipse Che and Che.OpenShift.io, the online Che service hosted by Red Hat. Uh, as he will tell you, he is an Italian, but is living, has been living in France for the last 10 years, uh, which is long enough to get a French accent when speaking English, but not long enough to prefer French cheese just yet. Our session today will show you the different components of a Che workspace, the resources it requires, the startup sequence, and answer other popular questions. Hopefully, leaving you with a, uh, a more, a better familiarity with the Che architecture uh, by the time our hour is up. If you have any questions at any point or comments uh, during the session, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Ask a Question tab, and I will make sure Mario gets to them. At this point, Mario, I'll turn it over to you. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for for having me. I uh, hope that uh, you're you can hear me uh, well. Uh, so I will I will talk about Eclipse Che, and in particular, we're gonna see the different components of uh, uh, Eclipse Eclipse Che. And uh, if you if you don't know Che, I will have a, I have a couple of, a couple of slides to uh, summarize what Eclipse Che is and uh, why is it useful. Um, so as basically, it, Eclipse Che is. Um, a server that allows you to run IDEs on Kubernetes, and that actually has a has a lot of uh, uh, benefits. The first one is that you, the developers, when when the uh, their IDE is running on Kubernetes and is accessible through a web browser, they will it will be easy to onboard new developers and to start a development workspace. So starting code code coding with zero effort. That's the first benefit. The second important uh, benefit of uh, using Eclipse Che as your uh, manager of IDEs is that your code will be protected in the sense that you don't need to clone locally your code. Your code will stay in the server, in the Git repository, or in the Kubernetes, um, in the Kubernetes cluster volumes. Uh, it will never transit your your uh, your laptop or your developer's laptop. Uh, it's, it doesn't um, prevent developers from doing that, but it allows workflow that uh, avoids downloading source code on local laptops. And uh, finally, uh, what it what uh, Che does is that it allows to define your development environments as code, so you can check in the definition of uh, your IDE, your dev development tools in your Git repository along with the source code of your application. And that, uh, so Eclipse Che, is, as I said, run on uh, Kubernetes, on Kubernetes cluster, and it's uh, easy to try it on uh, Che as a service, the hosted, hosted uh, version of Che by Red Hat. Uh, that is available on Che OpenShift.io. That's the easiest uh, way to try it. Uh, if you want more resources, or if you have want to play more with uh, the server side of Che, you probably want to try it locally. And we have many options with uh, local clusters, Kubernetes cluster like Minikube, Kind, uh, Docker Desktop. We've also uh, our documentation explains uh, how. But, uh, you can install it step by step on the uh, major public cloud, AWS, GCP, and Azure. And uh, we have an help chart and a Kubernetes operator that should uh, allow you to deploy Che on any Kubernetes cluster uh, on prem as well. So before going forward, the thing that I wanted to do is uh, I would like, I have a few instances here of uh, Che I would like to show you. Um, so the the first one here is actually a local uh, Che. We're going to use that local version of Che. 
uh, that is running on Minikube here on my, lap on, on my laptop. Uh, and here I have another version of Che that is actually Che OpenShift.io. So, and uh, there are the different stacks. And as I said, starting a, a development environment is as easy as uh, clicking on on uh, on the link, and that will provision uh, your IDE. That in a matter of in a, in in one minute or so, you will get uh, you will get it on on your browser. So that said, let's uh, now move forward with. Uh, uh, going a little bit more in deep in the different components of Eclipse Che. Uh, first, the first part is uh, the Che server part. So the Che server is a workspace manager. So it's uh, is multi-tenant, so it's, it's, um, it authenticates users and manage IDs of different users. One user can have multiple IDs, um, and it can start every IDs with just a click that actually will um, will be a request to the Chase server, an HTTP request that will uh, the Chase server will uh, then um, manage and will translate that in the creation of the resources uh, that will be the the IDE. the The Chase server is uh, just one small component of uh, of all the Che server components. So here I'm going to go a little bit more in deep on what are the different server components. And uh, that those uh, those components that you see here correspond to uh, different pods that you have once you install Che on your Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going um, to have a look at it. So here I have, uh, have Minikube that uh, is running. I'm in, I'm in the workspaces server uh, where I've deployed Che. And if I do kubectl get pod, <clears throat> I will see that, that I have uh, uh, six pods here. Uh, so the, the first one is the Che pod. So it's the Che server pod, the one that manages the workspaces as, w as we, have, uh, we have seen. Uh, then we'll have the uh, dev file registry. So this one that uh, is here on my slide as the uh, this dev file registry here uh, on the bottom left that is actually a catalog of the different stacks that you could use as a sample stacks uh, that we provide to users. Uh, you can, of course, uh, start developing. You do do, do um, build your custom stack with uh, any programming language that support that is supported by uh, our plugin system, and uh, with uh, any container that you would like to include in your development environment. Uh, but we provide a, a catalog of existing stacks with uh, the most popular technologies. So this <clears throat> the second one is the the second pod is the plugin registry. The plugin registry contains a, 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 the definition of um, some sidecar containers uh, that implement um, some extra functionality of uh, Che workspaces. So the IDEs functionality of your uh, of your uh, of our uh, workspace. Uh, for example, the editor part, uh, we you, you can we 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 support multiple editors. The default one is Eclipse Tia, is one, one ID based on Eclipse Tia that we call Che Tia. And is, uh, is, uh, uh, the look and feel is uh, like just your code, but in running in, in your browser. And actually, the definition uh, of uh, the container that will run the Node.js application that uh, powers uh, Eclipse Tia uh, is in the plugin registry. And along that with that, we have all the uh, plugins that, is, that are supported uh, by uh, Eclipse Tia and the definition of other uh, editors for Che. Uh, that's the plugin registry. So the, the other pod is the Che server. We, we have already seen it. Uh, then we have an identity provider that is uh, key clock by default that 
uh, allows to authenticate and authorize uh, users that um, open uh, the ID in their in their browser. If you're not authenticated, you're not able uh, to uh, access or start or uh, call the API of the Chase server. And and then there, there is Postgres. So we use a database uh, to store the metadata of the uh, workspaces of the different users. And then we have uh, uh, an operator or an Elm chart, depends on uh, what you prefer, uh, to um, provision all, all those pods. Uh, so the, the operator is a little bit more powerful, um, but uh, the Elm chart is, uh, is uh, well, uh, probably more widespread than, than the operator. Um, so those are the two installer for uh, for the chain for chain for the chase server part. So that's once you you run the operator or the Elm chart, you will have uh, the those five um, pods that will be uh, created. The uh, last one is the image pooler that allows to uh, pre-pool the most important images that you that will be needed when when users and developers will start their workspaces. So that means that. Uh, if you have a big cluster with uh, hundreds nodes, uh, and you know that most of your user will actually use one uh, particular editor like the Chetia, you will probably want to have uh, the Chetia image downloaded, pre-pooled on all the nodes, so that when a user wants to start an IDE, you won't need to to uh, to wait for uh, the Chetia container to be pulled. Uh, from the container registry. So that is pretty useful. Uh, I haven't installed uh, the image pooler uh, on my Minikube here. Uh, don't really need that. So I don't have a big cluster. It's just a single node cluster. So once I start Tia for the, the, the first time, when I start uh, Chetia, that container will be pre-pooled and I will have it here locally. So uh, I don't have the the... But I have I've uh, I've installed it using the operator, and the operator has then uh, installed all the other uh, started all the other pods of my uh, Chase server. That's uh, the uh, server components. Now we're gonna go uh, and see what actually are um, what what are the components of the Chase workspaces and uh, why we're we what, what are their role. So first of all, um, well, let's look at the definition of a chain workspace. Uh, it's uh, YAML. It can be it can be uh, even like a few lines. Uh, here, I have um, uh, kind of a complicated one. So just because I wanted to show uh, the different things that you can add in the definition of a chain workspace. So the first part is the project where you have the location of where your source uh, source code repository, Git repository is. Um, and that's the, the first thing that you encode in your definition of your Che workspace. So Che will know where it needs to clone uh, the source code. Then the, the, the second uh, section will be uh, the component section where you actually define the different um, component of your workspace. Here we have a couple of components uh, one is a development pooling uh, container that it actually will contain Java and Maven. And then we have a second one that actually is MySQL. So those two containers will be started when you start your IDE and will be started along with uh, the uh, editor itself uh, and with the plugins uh, of the editor. Uh, the last part is the comments part. So these are comments that the developer will will see will uh, will be able to uh, to see in the user interface. So you, you won't need to uh, do Maven clean install every time. It will be able uh, uh, it will be it will be possible for the developer uh, to access to the Maven build command executed without the need to um, to uh, to write it manually. So that, that can be uh, something that can be useful uh, to have uh, the build, the test, and run comments for newcomers that uh, don't know what the comments are, and will you, you, you can just encode them in the definition of, of the workspace. So that file can be shared 
uh, across all the team and all the developers will with using that dev file will be able to provision exactly the same um, the same repeatable development environment uh, with uh, the uh, right containers and the uh, right commands to to run um, their workspaces their the commands in the in the workspaces so uh, when we start when a workspace is started what happens so now uh, things get more interesting so what i will do is that i will actually so i've already so this this is this is my sample um uh, example that i started before i'm going to start another um uh, another uh, workspace here the the workspace that i've started here i'd started on openshift.io now I'm starting something on uh, my local machine. I will actually uh, use a link. So it's the easiest way to start a container. So I have, uh, I have a Spring Pack Clinic uh, Git repository on GitHub, on my account on, on, on GitHub. And I've, uh, I've included the dev file uh, here as the dev file, the, the YAML file that we, we have seen it, we have seen before. So let me make it a little bit bigger. Um, and so that's enough for um, adding just a link here that we call factory link. If a developer clicks here, it will, um, it will start an instance of uh, a Che workspace that will be using the, the definition that is here in, in this dev file here. So what I will do is that I will click here and that will start uh, my chain instance. So it, it found my dev file and it's starting uh, the workspace. So what, what actually will happen? So let's go back here and let's look at it. So the first thing is from my browser, I will the uh, dev file will be transmitted uh, to the Chase server that will analyze that and will actually start um, a pod on the Kubernetes uh, cluster where the Chase server is running. That is the, uh, the 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 plugin broker that is actually going to look at the uh, metadata of uh, of the plugins that are listed in the dev file. So it will get the, the, the metadata with the definition of the container, the sidecars that uh, are needed to run those plugins, and will uh, get them back to the Chase server. Once that is done, the Chase server will be able uh, to call the Kubernetes API with um, uh, to create uh, a, a deployment that actually will define the workspace pod that will First of all, run uh, in an init, as a, an init container uh, the plugin broker. That time will that will that in uh, that second time will actually run to get the Visual Studio Code extensions. Uh, in that case, Visual Studio Code extension because we're using Chetia that is uh, compatible with Visual Studio Code extension. So it's going to get Visual Studio Code extension that we want to include in in the workspace and uh, it will download them in a plugins volume where the id or the containers that will then be started after that uh, initial run of the plugin broker uh, those container will um, have access to the plugin volume and will then be able to uh, to uh, enable uh, all those extensions that are activate those extensions that are in uh, in the plugins volume so that's basically the process. So let's see if uh, if it has completed here. So it should have. Yeah. So uh, once it, it has started, no, now all the containers have started, uh, and it's cloning. It has also cloned the the uh, Git repository, and so I see the 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 Git repository. The GitHub repository where I started from has been cloned here, so I will be able, uh, so I can see the the dev file where that is actually the definition of the work workspace where 
that, is, that is running. Uh, and there is the, the Java source code. So let's just open one file. Uh, and we have the, um, the Java uh, VS Code code extension that is starting. Let's do that. Uh, we, we're we not going to uh, look too much here, but so, because that's not the goal is not, I'm not going to uh, look at the feature of the chain workspace, but I'm more interested in what's happening behind. So now the the um, Visual Studio Code extension uh, that, that supports, so the Java Visual Studio Code extension is running. I can see that is um, that it, there is an outline. So what happened here is that in the um, in that pod here, uh, I've so on in my browser. First of all, uh, the ID has been loaded, so there is a a part of the ID that is running on my browser. So and even if I go offline, I will be able to continue. Uh, editing in my browser, the, the, the source code, then there are some features that are actually um, require some uh, server side uh, services that won't be working. But the part that is in my browser uh, as uh, will the editor that is in my browser will continue working. So those are uh, the container that powers uh, that the, the IDE. So that are the, the backend services and we have so one editor container uh, that that where there is basically a Node.js application that is running and is actually uh, um, uh, that is powering the, the the editor that is Chetia, and to that we have uh, uh, added another container where we are running a Visual Studio Code extension uh, that where uh, the the Java Visual Studio Code extension that will provide us the Java support. Then there is another container that is the exec plugin container. That container is important uh, to run commands uh, from the browser. So it allows us to execute a command from our browser that will be executed in one of the different containers uh, of the workspace. So uh, it's the exec plugin uh, execute one um, shell command uh, in uh, in a, in in one of the comp components of the uh, of the J workspace, uh, it also powers the uh, the terminal that we have in uh, here. So in 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 our workspace. So if I make it a little bit bigger, so let me do like that, and I can open a terminal in my dev tooling and I will have a terminal and that terminal here is running on my browser but is the the uh, the back end is uh, running in so what I'm seeing here is a shell that has been open in uh, in the dev tooling container uh, that is running on the kubernetes on on the kubernetes uh, cluster uh, that I have uh, locally So let's go back to the, to the slide and uh, let's see the, the other, other components. So the, uh, the other one is the uh, old proxy container. There's a container that is, where, uh, that is actually dedicated to the authentication uh, the, of the HTTP request uh, that comes to the, uh, to here to the services uh, that are exposed uh, in the workspace. So we don't want that anybody um, anybody to be able uh, to use the IDE or to execute commands uh, in the workspace of somebody else. So we have uh, one um, proxy that takes all the connections. So all the connections need to go through that proxy and then uh, uh, the, the requests are routed to the right uh, service that is running in one of those containers. And then th these are these four containers are IDE tooling. So these are not something that I've defined in my um, in my, in my uh, dev file or that I will want to define as a user. So as a user, I would like more to define so my development tooling, so a version of Maven or Java, 
uh, and all the tools that I need, like Git or uh, any other tool that I would like to have in my command line. So that's the development tuning container. Uh, so I, I will have, I will want to have all the tools that I will need to um, build, test, uh, publish my uh, my application. Uh, so those tools are in this container. Then there will be another container that is my the my SQL container that is actually uh, will be useful when I test my application. Um, to so I will be able to use my application with uh, that version of uh, of my SQL. Those are just example. You can uh, change them with. Uh, whatever you you would like to customize uh, your workspace. So that's uh, um, that's basically it. So the the thing that I, want, I wanted to uh, to do is just make sure that we we have that um, on the if we go look on the cluster. So let's. Okay, so um, I have. Uh, if we if we look at the pods here, um, that's so we we have uh, uh, looked at it before. So we can see now that there is another pod. So this pod is actually that pod here that has been started. So we have the chase server pod right here, and then we have the the workspace pod that is uh, this last uh, pod here. I have. Uh, uh, a command here to get uh, container name, so workspace container name. So I will um, actually, that's a, uh, just if I look what, what it does, it's, it's, uh, it's, it does a kubectl uh, get pod and it uh, filter out for the, the workspace, the workspace pod I'm looking for, and then it gets uh, for all the all the different um, uh, uh, the different containers that are defined in the pod, it gets the name. So these are actually the different containers that are in the pod. That are the ones that I have here uh, listed in in the slide. So these are the the, the containers, uh, the different components that uh, power our um, ID. Um, let's say that there is something that is always uh, we we got always the the, the question about so, so if people want to try uh, try out Che they want to know how how many resources uh, what what's what are the resources that a Che workspace will will require um, and that's a difficult difficult question because that depends on a lot on what application you're going uh, to run what languages what framework you're going to run on your ID. So uh, the best an answer is always, uh, as always, as uh, it depends. Uh, but the best thing you can do is that you can uh, start your workspace and uh, take a look at the amount of memory that uh, your um, your your different containers are taking. So I add another alias for um, another comment to get che containers. Uh, memory limits, and we can see it's not those are in bytes. So um, I've done the 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 math. So except the, this one that is in in, in megabyte, but yeah, kubectl is returning um, those in 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 bytes. And if we go look here uh, on the slide. We see that uh, the editor is taking as as uh, as limit 500 uh, megabyte, so alpha gig and uh, one gigabyte dot five in one dot five gigabyte for the the Java Visual Code extension uh, that is required. I think it's that's that's that is the the default of the uh, of the Java extension. We are on the safe side, so we that's the limit. So we we don't want um, the Java VSO, VSO code extension to be uh, killed uh, when uh, we're indexing the the source code of our of projects. So we, we put an I um, memory limit here. Those values are you can customize. So uh, uh, those are all customizable, uh, but those are uh, 
the, the default here. The only one that I've uh, actually explicitly set on my dev file are uh, the de development tooling container. So I've set 500 megabyte for Maven and 500 megabyte for um, MySQL. And uh, the total is around 3.5 gigabytes. Uh, and I think that that so yeah the actually yeah the, the, this is um 125 megs from the uh jwt proxy so the um authentication proxy dev tooling is 500 megabyte my sequel is 300 megabytes so i think my slides are bad so i haven't put the the, the right number um but yeah then vso code is 1.5 gigabyte uh, and the uh, exec container is um, 125. Th these are like the default. Um, 125 megabytes is the default of uh, uh, of plugins that don't define a specific memory limit. And then the last is uh, the chat chat here, the the editor one that is um, that is taking 512. Uh, so that again, that common is uh, I get that. As uh, with, with with a kubectl command, so as just kubectl get pod, I get the uh, the, the pods and the pod, and then with no way, it's not okay. It should be better now. Um, so I get the output in JSON, and then I do I use JQ uh, to get the uh, containers. And to get the name of the container and the resource lim resources limit memory, so that's that's the uh, the command that I'm using to to get that. Uh, so that said, I think that um, so we are uh, we still have um, uh, I have still uh, ten minutes, and I will actually sh talk about something uh, some variations. Um, so what we have seen is the default uh, way to compose a chain workspace. We'll see a couple of variations for a couple of different things. Um, and the first one is uh, a different way uh, to containerize the IDE. So I've just, as we have seen, we have in the previous example, in the one that is running in my, in my browser right now, we have uh, split the, the different processes in different containers. Instead here, we have just one uh, development container, one container, and we are putting all our uh, applications. So the editor, the VSO code extension, uh, the proxy for authentication, MySQL, and all the tooling, Maven, etc. all will run in the same container. That has uh, some limits, and some benefits. So the main limits is are first of all is that uh, you're not isolating uh, your IDE from your uh, from the developer um, the development application the your, the application that you're testing. Um, so that is from uh, resources point of view. So will be will make your IDE or your application uh, more unstable. So uh, you, you don't have the containerization. So second second problem is that um, that container that is defined here is a result of the build of uh, of an image. So if um, you want to add something, so extend that, add other tools, you will probably need to do another uh, build and of of the, the, this, the, this image. And it is actually the image that contains the editor and contains a lot of dependencies. So that may be tricky because you may be ending with um, a custom image where your editor will be an editor that uh, you, you got a few months ago that you haven't updated. Uh, and then you need to maintain yourself your image where it's not um, an, is an isolated image that get updated by the upstream community and uh, your tool that you manage and you upgrade. So it's you're not decoupling the editor from uh, your your custom tool. Those are the limits. But on the other end, uh, you have some benefits uh, because 
you will have everything in the same container and those technologies are actually being designed um, to run on the desktop. So those are uh, are not new technologies. So those technologies like Visual Studio extensions are uh, processes that, that are being designed to run uh, in a laptop where actually the everything is is running in the same uh, in the same host. So um, when we we run in separate sidecars, we we have uh, um, faced a, uh, a lot of problems due to that. So that uh, the file system is not the same on every container. So the processes that you see are not the same. The environment variables, etc. So um, that means that that uh, if you put everything in one container, it won't be for a user uh, easy to maintain the customized, uh, um, uh, the, their customized workspace image, but uh, they won't occur in problems that are typical of uh, extension that are separated in, in different uh, containers. So um, that's, that's a benefit of, uh, of this approach. So what we are doing is that we are trying to um, to find uh, something in the middle of the two approaches uh, because having too many too many containers uh, may be complicated. May also add uh, some time when we start um, one workspace. Uh, and, but we want to have to make it repeatable and flexible as it is today. Uh, so we would like to keep this architecture of uh, set architecture uh, still. So that's one uh, different way of doing containerization. So another way where we could do some things different is that in the example that we had before, uh, the development tooling where, Ma where we had Maven uh, and Java, um, we actually were running the application, the pet clinic application there and MySQL was running in that same pod as well. Uh, that means that we are somehow uh, modifying the production uh, container, the production image. So because we, we are adding container uh, to, that, to that image and we're not, we don't have a parity between production and development. Uh, so that can be an issue. So maybe another, another way to do that would be uh, to run the uh, production containers uh, without any uh, modification and running the Kubernetes uh, pod of, so the work, the workspace Kubernetes pod as a sidecar to that uh, production containers and uh, doing the build. So using Maven and the development tooling in the workspace pod. But then once we have the result, we, up, we could update uh, the the production uh, the production uh, pod uh, either copying the artifact that is the result of the build in from the uh, workspace pod to another pod uh, to the, um, uh, the the production pod um, doing that or even um, rebuilding the image and uh, doing a rolling update of the production. Uh, the, 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 the production image. So that's another approach. The problem is that uh, copying the artifact or uh, rebuilding the image are operation tasks that takes time, that take time. So it may add to the inner loop. So when you're developing, you probably want to see the result immediately. You don't want to wait for an image to be rebuilt and a rolling update of your application. So uh, there is, it's, so we're not in 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 the when we build and run in the same pod of where we have the development tooling, we don't have a parity of production and development, but is uh, more more uh, fast. On the other end, with this approach here that I'm showing, you have uh, you, you are using exactly the same definition of your uh, production pod, but it can take more time to update the application when you are in the inner room. So these are these were the uh, the two things that I wanted to mention on the uh, how we could manage things different and of the different components of a, of a chain workspace. And uh, with that, we'll go to the conclusions. Um, so we have seen that um, so Eclipse chain with Eclipse, chain, we, you can start 
um, you can start uh, coding with zero effort. With just one click, you're able uh, to start a development workspace. You protect your code, so your code you're not uh, going to transit to be cloned on a local laptop. And uh, you, your development environment is defined as code and lives in your Git repository. Uh, there is a Che server that is a manager of workspaces. And uh, a Che workspace is actually powered by uh, a few pods, uh, one pod with a few containers in it. And we have seen that from a memory point of view, uh, the, the resources that are used by that workspace are similar to what a desktop ID will all actually uh, use. Uh, so last, uh, here are some links uh, to, um, to learn more about Che. You can go on the Che website or um, uh, you can contribute to uh, to our source, to our repository, Git repository, but just uh, opening issues or asking questions, uh, providing feedback or uh, uh, helping with the documentation or even um, doing opening a pull request to uh, add some uh, some new features. Uh, we, you can reach us uh, on Twitter as well and on Matter, most, most of our engineers um, We'll, we'll answer any questions. We're always, uh, there is always somebody to answer a question on, uh, on the um, Eclipse Che channel of the Eclipse uh, Mattermost. So with that, so I've, uh, uh, I'm, I've finished my, um, my presentation. So if there is any, any question, I will be happy to answer. Thanks, Mario. Uh, we do have one question in the chat from Ramdas. I think I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, he asks, how do you install Che in restricted environments? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty uh, pretty good question. So we've, uh, we've been uh, adding the uh, support for restricted environments um, in the last year or so, we've been working a lot on that. So, uh, Che today is is mature. So, on that, uh, from that point of view, uh, so we have instructions to um, to deploy uh, Che in a restricted network with with OpenShift uh, because OpenShift, uh, so the, the Red Hat Kubernetes uh, distribution, uh, as uh, provides some. Um, tools that some commands that will allow to mirror all the images that will be required by Che. So what 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 Che will do is actually will um, will continue running as it as, as it is. It's only that there are a couple of things that are that need to be done. First of all, the images that the Che workspaces and the Che server components need need to be mirrored in the uh, internal uh, registry that is in the restricted network. So Che will be able to so to call the Kubernetes API and say, okay, please start uh, that pod with that containers and, and Kubernetes will be able to start um, those those containers because it will find the image in the uh, local uh, registries. So that's for the container part. It's just a matter of mirroring. Again, OpenShift, Red, Open, Red Hat, OpenShift, um, does that um, makes that e easy, really easy, so it's not painful. Um, then I don't know the redistribution how how uh, they manage that, but um, that's done uh, with a few comments on, on OpenShift. So you provide the list of images that are required by Che. We have the, that list on our documentation, and that's it. Then the second the the, the second thing that uh, we need to be careful of are um, the dependencies, like Maven dependencies. Uh, so for that, we uh, we have a mechanism to inject um, the configuration for um, the Maven settings XML, for example, or for other languages like um, so Python with pip or Golang, etc. All the dependencies of all the different uh, languages. So uh, you we have a mechanism to uh, inject the configuration that are needed um, to uh, provide the URL of uh, the repository on the uh, restricted network where the dependency should be looked 
uh, for and uh, once that is injected it will be possible uh, then to start the pod the, the the workspace pod will start and you will be able to do maven clean install and all the dependency will be fetched uh, by uh, from from that uh, repository so I don't think I've uh, so the other thing is the source code of course the the git repository need to be in the restricted network Otherwise, uh, Che won't be able to clone uh, the Git repository. And our example, we are actually packaging the, zip, the the source code in zip files so that when you deploy Che in a restricted environment, you will be able um, to use the example um, without having to go to to clone the uh, the example source code uh, from a GitHub repository that is not available, is not reachable, you will just, so Che will just uh, get um, the source code from the zip file and um, uh, copy it locally. So that you will be able to start. I think that was a, a fairly thorough answer. Uh, Rob does, I hope that answers your question. He says, thank you. So it, it seems like it has. Uh, another question from Andreas, um, you may have already touched on it. But how does Che compare to uh, Thea? If you have touched on that already, maybe just give like the brief, uh, the brief overview, the key points. No, I mean I, I think it's a it's a it's a really good question. Um, I haven't touched that uh, much, so I've talked a little bit about it. But um, it, so the Eclipse Tia is a framework uh, for to build IDs, and. We're using that framework. We are one of the uh, main uh, contributors uh, to uh, to Eclipse Tia project, and we're using that to build uh, Che Tia. That is, it's our default editor. It's the one that we use. So we um, we have uh, we have contributed a lot of uh, um, of features, like for example, the support for Visual Studio Code extension is something that. Uh, our so the Red Hat team has has contributed the uh, um, uh, yeah the beginning of of the project and we are continuously investing in that we're investing a lot of time and effort in that so uh, Ti is really uh, Che Tia is really part of uh, of Che today. Uh, on the other end, we see customers that are asking for um, other um, the using other editors, uh, in particular for IntelliJ. So we we have also um, as a user you can we can select to start your workspace uh, using as uh, the on the ID part uh, IntelliJ. So, so it will be IntelliJ that will run in a container, and then that you will be able to and you will be able to access the UI uh, through VNC with, with uh, from your um, from your web browser. So that's how it works, and then we have also uh, some community some uh, community support. So there, there's been um, some great uh, contribution in our community. So not something that is uh, comes from our teams that uh, have contributed um, uh, coder support. Uh, so the, it's another um, cloud IDE that uh, that we uh, that uh, you can run in your browser, and is actually it's just uh, um, uh, another a build of uh, VS code. So it's VS code that, that runs in your uh, in your browser. So you have options, but we have we have chosen um, Tia today as uh, as the the default one, the one where we we invest more. And most of the plugins that we have today works for Tia and do not work for IntelliJ or for uh, or for Coder. Thank you again from Andreas. And just to build on that a little bit further, you touched on it with IntelliJ, um, but beyond Eclipse, Tia, uh, what other editors do Che Workspaces support? Yeah, it's so now today, if I'm not mistaken, so the we we support um, uh, IntelliJ, uh, we support. Uh, Chetia, we support uh, Coder, we support uh, Eclipse Desktop, um, and uh, I'm forgetting one. So we had Jupyter support at some point and Dirigible. So the uh, yeah, Dirigible, um, Jupyter, Jupyter is. I think we we have removed that because today you can run 
uh, Jupyter from uh, within Tia. Uh, so yeah, Jupyter notebooks, uh, these are really popular. Um, and so, but don't, that, that now works from using a Visual Studio extension. Uh, so using the Python Visual Studio extension, so we don't need to maintain a separate editor for that. Uh, we can just use uh, uh, use Jetia. So, but yeah, you, there is also um, uh, the the Eclipse desktop Eclipse IDE that you can run in your browser. But that's something that we we haven't invested a lot. Um, we don't. So th those are technologies that are not being designed to run in your browser. Uh, so the um, the 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 um, the final um, feedback user experience of a user we think that uh, would probably be better uh, for us to invest on web technologies rather than um, adapting existing desktop technologies uh, to uh, uh, to run in the browser so how different than would you say the web ides are compared to the desktop ides well, I think that we are getting more and more closer. Uh, so as as everything, um, so the uh, we we have more and more application that we do not install anymore on our laptop. If I if I need to if I start uh, counting the number of application that um, I've uh, installed locally, so graphical application, th these are like really uh, less and less every year. So most of the application that we're using are uh, starting using web technologies and um, use that. So uh, for IDEs, I think that we are uh, at the point where we are really starting. So we have seen Microsoft and GitHub with uh, GitHub Code Spaces that um, have, have released um, so the uh, version of VSO code that is running in your browser. Uh, so there are other uh, competitors that we have um, on on the space that are, we are doing exactly the same thing. So and more and more there are uh, big companies that are investing in that. We think that that's that's uh, inevitable. Um, the the thing that is uh, that changes uh, the challenge that we have when when you run in a browser. Uh, there are a few challenges. So the first one is from a security point of view is that your application is is going to run. Uh, in a platform that is shared with uh, other applications, so you need to be really careful about security. You cannot. There are a lot of things that you you, you are not allowed to do uh, to avoid uh, cross-origin uh, attacks. Um, so, and browser are more and more strict about that. So that's something that makes um, building an application in the uh, running in the browser more difficult than. Um, building an application with the same technologies that will actually run in Electron, for example, uh, you, you have you have uh, uh, more constraints. You have uh, uh, so that that is something that makes it uh, difficult. The other thing are um, like resources uh, you need when you run your application when uh, when a part of your application is running in the cloud, um, you need to be. Uh, to be careful of um, every uh, kilobyte that is actually used because it, it's uh, you, you you need to uh, consume the 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 minimum that is uh, required if your application starts using uh, too much memory is not like in your laptop that uh, you have a lot of memory available on the cloud you don't have all that memory so you your your application will be killed uh, so you need to be careful so there are, there are a few uh, gotchas that um, you need to have when 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 you, when you need to um, uh, yeah start running an ID on your um, on your browser. Understood. Um, we had another question come in from Anup. Uh, he asks or she asks, what is the framework Eclipse Che uses for testing? Huh. It depends on the. So we have forty three repository Git repositories. Uh, we have. Uh, um we have we have components written in go uh orders in java uh order in typescript so we have all kind of uh um repository and we, we don't have 
one framework for for testing so uh, the our java um application so our java uh part so the the main one the, the chase server uh that is gonna use uh, junit is not the same as the uh our uh, operator that is in go and uh is going to use uh the go um uh, go test that's uh so for for testing so um on the on the uh on the id part so we we are on the uh, end to end test we uh we are running so we are using selenium as well so um there are some end to end tests that we run on selenium but so there is no one one uh, framework that we use for for testing and then andreas i guess is kind of a follow up to that is asking why why the need for the 43 git repositories hmm. well because we um so we have a lot of uh, uh, so for 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 the different components we have started we 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 have basically a different container, a uh, different repository. Um, not sure if we currently are able to uh, we could probably be able to reduce that um, today. So we have been we have been doing an effort. Uh, so we had at some point. Uh, we had a lot of repository because we had sidecars uh, for uh, sidecars for uh, every Visual Studio Code extension. Like for example, if you want to run uh, Go, the Go Visual Studio Code extension, you probably will need uh, to run it in a container that has Go and um, other tools that will, you will need when you do uh, Go tooling. So Go tooling. Um, then if you have your Java uh, VS Code extension, you will probably need another container. Uh, so we ended up with um, supporting um, tens of languages and with uh, tens of uh, sidecars. And we had one Git repository for every Docker file. Um, and with the, with the Docker file came also um, some script, etc., that would run on the sidecar. So I think that most of those are because of that. But then, so we have, have, have you seen, we have uh, uh, six component server side, uh, then we have uh, uh, all the sidecars and uh, all their six components on the, on, on the uh, side of the, um, of the workspace. So that means that we, I don't think that we'll never be able to have less than 30, 30 Git repositories. Got it. Um, and so we'll just end off with one question here. So we, so we end on time and don't take any more of your time. Uh, this has been great. But the last question is what features are coming with the next releases of Eclipse Che and, and what are you working on right now? Yeah, thanks for for the question. That's uh, yeah, interesting one. Um, we are uh, there are a few things that we're working on. Uh, of course, um, I don't want to um, yeah to unveil all the um, the things that we so the, the there are some big changes that we are working on, but we don't know exactly when we will be able to um, deploy them, etc. So, but. Uh, there are a couple of things that are coming that are interesting. So first is uh, um, suggestions, so recommendations. So when uh, you start a Git repository, so we have seen that you you can start um, your workspace, your Che workspace from a Git repository. You have seen that we add a dev file in that Git repository. But uh, when you don't have a dev file in that Git repository, you the you you won't actually you will have the default workspace that doesn't have plugins that doesn't that only contains an editor uh, and the the exec and the authorization plugin that we've seen before. So at that point, when you start uh, your workspace and you don't have plugins, uh, and we see that there are some Java files that will start recommending uh, to users if they recommending some uh, plugins and ext extensions and uh, a stack uh, so we we uh, will will introduce that in the in the next months so that's uh, that's something another thing that more for uh, on the enterprise side we want to support uh, multiple 
running CHE across multiple Kubernetes clusters. So we are working um, on that as well. So we'll have uh, uh, one single entry point uh, for CHE, uh, and, uh, but then the workload, so the, the workspaces may be provisioned on one of uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters. So that, that is required for customers that have uh, developers that are uh, distributed geographically uh, or for big teams that have uh, uh, that want to have more than uh, 100 developers, um, being able to have more than 100 developers uh, coding uh, concurrently. Great, well, I think that's uh, something that everyone can really look forward to. Um, so I think we're out of questions for the, for the time being. Uh, so we'll wrap this up. Uh, Mario, thank you very much for joining us today. I think this was an, an amazing session. Uh, and we'll have this on YouTube in just a few hours if people would like to rewatch it, or you can rewatch it anytime um, by using this link. Um, so thank you very much, Mario. I am going to publish right now a survey. If anyone wants to complete that and let us know how you enjoyed the session, uh, feedback is always appreciated. The next session for Cloud Tool Time is deploying a Quarkus application into Kubernetes using JQ. Uh, and that's on February 16th, presented by Mark Nuri, also from Red Hat. Um, and Mario, you're actually back in May with another Cloud Tool Time Eclipse Chain GitHub code spaces. Is that correct? Yeah. So we will see you then. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.